Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, business advocates are pushing back on the proposed corporate transit fee. It would force multi-million dollar companies in the state to ante up in order to rescue NJ Transit. It puts New Jersey at a situation of not being competitive. Plus, attention WIC recipients. New Jersey's trying to become the first state to offer online ordering and home delivery of groceries, baby formula, and other daily needs. Grocery ordering online doesn't seem like something that's like elite or privileged, but for some people it really isn't an option. And I think it's just a thoughtful way of opening up the program to more people. Also, New Jersey goes Hollywood, ramping up efforts to make towns in the state film ready. And celebrating Passover, Jewish communities here in New Jersey gather with heavy hearts for their first Seder since the Israel-Hamas war broke out. As hard as it feels this year to come together in a celebratory way, um, it is actually an act of sacred defiance to do so, and it is our Jewish obligation to do so. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Governor Murphy's proposed corporate transit fee may be the biggest flashpoint in this year's state budget negotiations. The 2.5% tax would hit New Jersey's roughly 600 top earning companies, with the money going to help plug New Jersey Transit's massive budget hole. But the idea is getting criticism from a number of sectors, including the business community, which argues it'll make New Jersey a much less enticing place to lure the C-suite. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. It puts New Jersey at a situation of not being competitive. Business lobbyists are pushing back hard against Governor Murphy's proposed 2.5% corporate transit fee, a surcharge designed to rescue NJ Transit from plunging off a fiscal cliff and keep the beleaguered agency on a stable funding track. The extra fee atop New Jersey's current 9% corporate tax could raise up to a billion dollars a year, but business leaders instead suggested using New Jersey's fast-growing sales tax revenues to fund transit. You know, sales tax increases every year by nature of inflation. Costs go up and therefore sales tax goes up. And if you just dedicated the future funding stream of the increase in sales tax, um, you could find that you would probably have a good revenue source from there. Jersey's 6.625% sales tax is projected to generate an extra half billion dollars next fiscal year, and raising the tax rate back up to its former 7% could crank out even more cash for NJ Transit, says NJ BIA President Michelle Sikirka. There is the opportunity to go back to that, that 7 because we're in the realm of it and dedicate that amount. We cannot afford to continue to put working families on the hook. I, we are facing many fiscal crises, and New Jersey transit is just one of them. Progressive advocates call sales taxes regressive and unfair because they bite a larger portion of earnings from lower income folks who can least afford it. Progressives charge New Jersey's big corporations can afford to pay a 2.5% surcharge. Why are we continuing to put the burden on the backs of regular everyday New Jerseyans instead of asking corporations like Amazon, Walmart, and Bank of America to pay their fair share and invest in the types of programs and services like NJ Transit? But even Democrats have expressed some doubt about funding transit with corporate taxes, which some call a volatile revenue source that might fall short of NJ Transit's needs. My concern is that it's not going to reach the level that you, you, we all think it might reach, and then you're going to have still a, a, a problem, um, you know, year to year for the next couple of years. And if they are looking to dedicate this to New Jersey Transit, and New Jersey Transit is looking for stability, which it is in a dedicated funding stream, 
This may not be the tax to go for. Business leaders say they want to see an audit at NJ Transit. The agency's currently spending more than $6 million on a feasibility study, looking for up to 20% in budget cuts and some service adjustments. Meanwhile, a coalition of New Jersey businesses claims the governor reneged on his promise to let Jersey's 2.5% corporate tax surcharge expire by proposing this new transit fee on 600 companies earning at least $10 million a year, and it's retroactive to January 1st. We're two quarters into this already, so the clawback effect of this, this tax and this fee is going to be very impactful on those companies. That's going to trickle down. I think that this entire tax has a lot to do with pushing people out of New Jersey, not just how to keep them in New Jersey. And I have a hard time believing that companies like Amazon and Walmart are all of a sudden going to you know, pull up their stakes <laughs> and, and hightail it out of New Jersey simply because we're asking them to pay a tax, which, mind you, they had already been paying uh, last year. But analysts warn if New Jersey once again enacts the nation's highest corporate tax, some companies could decide to grow their investments elsewhere. In Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Well, state health leaders want to make access easier for the 240,000 people here who are part of the federally funded WIC program, which provides healthy food, baby formula, and other necessities to low-income moms and their children by offering, for the first time ever, online grocery shopping and delivery. If approved, New Jersey would be the first state in the nation to offer that option in the program. Groups that work with struggling families say it would make a big difference in their lives. But the change require about $3 million in taxpayer funds and legislative approval. Healthcare writer Lilo Stainton joins me now with the details. Hey, Lilo, good to talk to you. So I'm curious, what's the thinking, the rationale behind making this uh, online option and, and home delivery option available? Well, I think my understanding, I mean, and, and Commissioner Bastin um, talked about it as sort of modernizing, uh, you know, WIC, the WIC program. Um, and this is a program that's been around for decades, right? Um, and it's proved really successful. I think the thinking is just there are so many more people that could benefit, but don't because of a key little piece, a you know, a missing link in the chain. Maybe they don't have a bus pass or, you know, they, they don't have access to a car or, you know, the stores in their neighborhood don't have the products they need. I mean, there's that are in walking distance. So I think this is like trying to close those little gaps that we, you know, as reporters, we see so often in these programs that are well-intentioned and set up to succeed, but then miss out on some people because of those tiny little disconnects, you know? Well, and during the pandemic, of course, we saw a lot of the online ordering options expand, be it groceries right. or other items, uh, WIC, as I understand, and you can correct me, is um, infant formula, uh, breastfeeding necessities, and foods for moms and their kids, low-income moms exactly. and their kids. Exactly, and so, a suite of other sort of referrals and connections to other programs. So the local WIC offices do a lot. Um, and, you know, as you say, it became so common to online order during the pandemic. I think we forget that this is sort of one of those privileges that many of us have that we don't even think of as, you know, grocery ordering online doesn't seem like something that's like elite or privileged. But for some people, it really isn't an option. And I think it's just a thoughtful way of opening up the program to more people. So they need about $3 million, as you reported, and obviously approval from the legislature to get this into the budget. Where does that stand? And who do they feel it'll help most out of the moms who are using this program? Well, one of the interesting things is that if you look at federal statistics, more than half of uh, nationwide of WIC users are actually the children. So it's it's new moms, of course, but it's also children in poor families. So this might be on top of other benefits that they would receive as the family, maybe food stamps or, or um, SNAP, as it's now called. I'm not a mother, but from talking to mothers, I understand that, you know, when you're home with a newborn, it's really hard, right? You've got so much going on. And um, this could just, you know, the ability to get food delivered sounds like it could really be a lifeline. Um, so I, it clearly that's going into it because they have sort of framed it under under sort of the, the wider 
um, efforts the state is doing to improve maternal health and maternal and infant health care. So you laid out what mm -hmm. the Department of Health Commissioner put as all of the, the positives, the pros for having a program like this, but did you hear from any advocates about where there might be complications? Right. Well, some, right. And now, of course, when you talk to the, the people who are doing this work on the front lines, they point out all kinds of, you know, potential wrinkles, including, you know, a lot of poor families don't have good internet access. You know, there are also questions about um, families that live in in um, facilities, in buildings that might be secure, where, you know, nobody can get in from the outside to drop off groceries. Mm. If they can't get downstairs at that moment, they'd miss that connection. So there's a concern there about groceries being stolen or misplaced. So, you know, clearly the state has to think through the details on this, um, but it's an interesting proposal that the legislature is now going to have to weigh. Yeah, and they'll have to do that uh, by July 1st when the budget needs to be finalized. Lilo Stainton for us. Lilo, thanks so much. Thank you, Bree. Disparities also exist within other programs available to New Jersey moms. Despite experiencing mental health issues at twice the rate of white mothers, black mothers are twice as unlikely to get help for maternal mental health issues. Advocates say that's due to factors like financial barriers and fear of stigma, involvement of child welfare services. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas visited Care Plus NJ's Maternal and Family Center to see how they're working to address mental health for black women before, during, and after pregnancy. Maternal mental health conditions are the leading cause of maternal death. So if we're not addressing maternal mental health, not just the physical, if we're not addressing the mental health, if we're not screening, we're doing a major disservice to not only black moms, but all moms of all colors in New Jersey. Maternal mental health has come into focus as a major contributor to the staggering disparities that exist in maternal and infant deaths in New Jersey and the nation. That's why Care Plus, a mental health care provider, has created the Maternal and Family Center, specifically for women and birthing people who need that support, but too often don't get it. About 75% of women uh, struggling with changes in their mental health before, during, or after pregnancy do not get treatment. And black moms are even more likely to go untreated, yet also more likely to suffer from depression or other mental health concerns, says Ladina Artis. One in five women will experience um, some form of maternal mental health condition over the course of the prenatal or postpartum period. Um, for black women, it's two times higher than that of white women and 50% of black women during the prenatal and postpartum period will experience a mental health condition related to pregnancy and postpartum. Less than half will access treatment. Artist points to a complicated combination of causes that lead to these higher rates of illness and lower rates of treatment for black women. What stands out the most is just the history of structural racism, implicit bias definitely plays a role in, you know, um, how uh, black mothers and birthing people are treated, whether it's medical or mental health facilities when they're reaching out, not feeling understood, not feeling heard as if they have a voice. Care Plus is working to strengthen its relationships with other care providers in the area to let them know they're here as a resource for those mental health care services, which are completely covered by insurance. We're getting referrals from OBGYNs, from hospitals, kind of giving us of a history of what they're going through. From there, they're seen within about four to five days um, with, with their first intake. And at the end of the day, what we do is we hear them out. We try to understand where all of this is coming from, how is it coming out within their lives. And then from there, they get assigned a um, therapist. We can see whether they would need medication um, or if they would 
uh, benefit from family therapy as well. And Care Plus is now offering those other providers training to improve their screening process to better identify any mental health concerns their patients may have. And then also what to do if somebody does yield a positive screening, how to link them, how to access the care so that we really have that strong continuum of care across the board. There's no judgment at all whatsoever. Our main goal is to help these moms get through this period in time. Patients can begin receiving care here from the early family planning stages all the way to two years postpartum. And if they still need care after that, they can be referred to a mental health care provider here within the Care Plus system. In Rochelle Park, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, rolling out the red carpet for Hollywood. Long before the West Coast made its name as home to the film industry, New Jersey was the movie capital of the world. And the Murphy administration has been working for the last several years to reclaim that title, offering tax incentives to film companies and making trips to L.A. to promote the incentives here. So today the state held a workshop for counties and towns, getting them up to speed with the benefits of hosting on-location filming in their communities and what they'll need to do in order to be film ready. Melissa Rose Cooper reports. Anne Hathaway in South Amboy, Ben Kingsley in Booton, uh, Timothy Chalamet in Watchung, Christopher Maloney in Edison. Just some of the many celebrities Steve Gorlick says have helped make New Jersey an iconic setting for international box office hits. Gorlick says the film industry, which actually started in the Garden State, has been a major boost to the economy. How about $700 million? That's the revenue from the, the, the state of uh, 2022 alone uh, from film and television production. So that comes from attracting some 95 features in 2022, uh, uh, 21 major television, uh, telefilms and miniseries, a total of 99 television series and specials. Uh, that comes from having over 1,172 shooting days in the state in a single year and creating well over 14,000 jobs uh, from tax credit projects alone. And now the New Jersey Economic Development Authority and the New Jersey Motion Picture and Television Commission are showing municipalities across the state how they can attract production in their communities, hosting this Film Ready workshop at the Morris Museum in Morristown. Film Ready is a five-step program that educates municipalities on the basics of motion picture and television production and enable cities and towns to effectively accommodate location filming and make their and market their communities as filming destinations. The program just sets basic standards for attracting filmmaking and positions the state as a pro top produ production destination. It's our goal to establish certified film ready communities in all of our 21 counties that can assist film and television production crews on a local level, which will better serve their communities and the motion picture and television industry for years to come. It's a great opportunity for people to see us through a different lens, and it's a great opportunity for us to understand others through a different lens. Craig Schlosser, president and CEO of the Morris County Economic Development Alliance, credits the film industry for encouraging more inclusivity and opportunities within Morris County. Last year, Morris County got $1.4 million in incentives from the NJEDA for film production. We have 166 filming locations, and we have over 70 different businesses, mainly small businesses, signed up on the state's production service directory. The governor last week said over and over that for every $1 that the state spends to keep entertainment here, um, 6 to $8 come back out into the local economy. John Crowley also says having production crews set up in communities can be a huge plus for just about anyone looking for a job. But we're not just talking about PAs. We're not just talking about grip and electric. We're also talking about um, you have people that are in trade schools right now, great carpenters or people that are uh, skilled in making things with their hands. Um, that's an entree position into the art department or props. Um, what about people that have an interest in fashion? wardrobe, makeup, hair. What about people that have business degrees that are coming out, kids that want to get into entertainment but don't have a clear path forward? 
the production offices on set are always looking for people that have an accounting background. And as the film industry continues to expand through New Jersey, its revenue is expected to soon reach the billion dollar threshold. Proof of the Garden State's place as a major filming hub well into the future. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. On Wall Street, stocks climb today as earnings kick into high gear. Here's where the markets closed on this Tuesday. An update tonight on Wall Street Journal reporter and New Jersey native Evan Gershkovich. A Moscow court today rejected his appeal seeking to end his pretrial detention, meaning the 32-year-old from Princeton will remain in jail on espionage charges until at least June 30th. Gershkovich was detained by Russian authorities over a year ago while on a reporting trip. His family, friends, the journal, and the U.S. government have all defended his innocence and denied the espionage allegations from the Kremlin. Members of the media were allowed inside the courtroom to see him today for the first time in months. Gershkovich looked relaxed while inside the defendant's box, cracking a smile and even laughing at times while talking to his legal team. Russian officials tell the Wall Street Journal confidential discussions about a prisoner exchange are taking place between the Kremlin and Washington. Gershkovich's loved ones also appear to be staying strong. Last night, his close friends posted on X that his family saved an empty seat for him at their Passover Seder dinner. Many Jewish communities gathering for Passover this year are leaving empty seats at their table to symbolize the Israeli hostages who remain in captivity with Hamas. The holiday is playing out against the backdrop of the ongoing Israel-Hamas war in Gaza. It's a time of heightened emotions and, for some, fear. But as Ted Goldberg reports, despite differences and heavy hearts, the more than 1,000-year tradition goes on. On Passover? Jewish people ask, why is this night different from all other nights? Amid six months of war in Israel and widespread protests on college campuses, I asked Rabbi Mark Katz, why is this Passover different from all other Passovers? It's a scary time, but at the end of the day, Jewish history is scary. And part of the Passover Seder is reminding ourselves that every generation, people are seeking our destruction. Rabbi Katz has led Temple Ne'er to Meet in Bloomfield for about six years. Concerns from his congregation include how to break bread, or matzah, while avoiding arguments. People, for example, who might be in different political places than their kids, who might be in different places with this war. The war in Israel is a difficult subject, and avoiding discussion around Israel during a Seder is next to impossible. Not only the fact that we end with the words next year in Jerusalem, but that we're constantly hearkening back to ancient times, to the temple, that we ask God to, for example, defend the Jews against those who seek our destruction. The liberation from Egypt is really the epitome of who we are because we're constantly being liberated. Stanley Keels says going to Seder's and hearing the familiar story of Passover is a connection to his roots. This year's Seder had a major twist. The change to the story is that Jews uh, have joined with the Palestinians as also being held captive. So my wish and hope with Passover is praying that we can our prayers will help free these people. The fact that there are still hostages with no sign of them coming home anytime soon, um, you know, the messages that we read in our Haggadah and at our Passover seders around our table feel so poignant this year in a different way. Lucy Fishbein is the senior cantor at Temple B'nai Jeshurun in Short Hills. As hard as it feels this year to come together in a celebratory way, um, it is actually an act of sacred defiance to do so, and it is our Jewish obligation to do so. She's also concerned about reports of anti-Semitic language used at protests on some college campuses. While groups have called for divestment from Israel at Rutgers without criticizing Jewish people as a whole, Fishbein has heard reports from other schools with protesters using disturbing language. 
we're seeing on college campuses that they're saying October 7th is going to happen 10,000 times to you. That would mean 12,000 Jews would die. I do find that when something happens in Israel, there are people who become emboldened to, to say things that they wouldn't normally say. Rabbi Katz says the problem is when groups conflate Jewish people with Israel's government. Criticizing Israel, which is right, people are allowed to. They have to draw a distinction between the Israeli government, the Israeli people, and Jews. And if you start lumping those three things in, you start getting dangerously close to anti-Semitism. Yesterday, the chancellor's office at Rutgers put out a letter saying they were, quote, troubled and concerned about the unsettling rise in the number of bias reports particularly incidents of anti-Semitism on our campuses. They also said Rutgers would create an advisory council for Jewish life, coming as Jewish people continue celebrating Passover over eight days and nights. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. And that does it for us tonight. But don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton, and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.